from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. My name is Peter Young, and I'm chief of the Asian Division here at the library. And it's my pleasure to welcome you in our intimate setting here uh, to the members' room here at the library. Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador, I'll try to make, make, a, make a correct pronunciation of your last name. I won't try for your first name. I'll have to get you to do that for us. Bek Bekbat, Ambassador from Mongolia and distinguished guests, uh, we expected and perhaps might even still have, uh, Congressman Joseph Pitts, co-chairman of the House U.S.-Mongolian Caucus, with us this morning. Uh, for some reason, there is a, uh, a very important activity on Capitol Hill today and for the next few days relating to, I think, the mis mysteries of U.S. health care. Uh, but I think we're going to have uh, a substitute with uh, Betsy Christian, uh, Congressman Pitts' legislative assistant join, us in, assistant, join us in a moment. But on behalf of the Library of Congress, James Billington, and the Asian Division, I want to welcome you to today's presentation by Dr. Alicia Kampi, who will be discussing her recent book, and we have copies here, The Impact of China and Russia on the United States, Mongolian Political Relations in the 20th Century. Dr. Kampi is a former U.S. diplomat, president of the Mongolian Society, president of the U.S. Mongolian Advisory Group, and president of the Shingis. I want to say Genghis, but it's Shingis Khan Foundation, is that correct? She holds a PhD in Mongolian Studies from Indiana University and Masters of Art in East Asian Mongolian Studies from a northern institution called Harvard. Her co-author, uh, R. Bassan, is a retired Mongolian diplomat with over 30 years of service. This book offers the first in-depth analysis of the political relationship between the United States and Mongolia and the establishment of formal diplomatic relations in 1987. The authors are former diplomats with firsthand experience of Mongolian-U.S. negotiations. They conducted extensive interviews with the parties involved with these negotiations and researched primary source documents at the National Archives, the Mongolian National Archives in Ulaanbaatar, and sources here in the Asian Division at the Library of Congress. During their research, they were able to discover many previously unknown documents. This library has over 147 million items. Its staff of about 3,000 individuals uh, work continuously to dig into, to discover those, those valuable jewels and items in our collection. But with the help of readers and dedicated experts and scholars, we make terrific progress in mining the gold and treasures from this collection. The extensive 43-page bibliography, and I must admit that I'm in awe of a 43-page bibliography in, I think, nine-point type, I believe, <laughs> with more than 1,200 footnotes for this wonderful book, reflect the depth of research and dedication involved. The authors provide a comprehensive resource that will provide a treasure trove for further explorations into this fascinating diplomatic history. We look forward to hearing Dr. Campi's, Campi's introduction to her work and, we, and welcome her to return to the Library of Congress to begin working on her forthcoming second book with her record of scholarship and discovery. I'm certain that she will continue to unlock even more of the treasures included in the Asian Division's comprehensive collections for Mongolia, China, and the rest of Asia. Finally, we have a small display introducing the Mongolian collections here in the Asian Division reading room located at the very end of this hallway. And all of you are welcome to visit uh, uh, after the program this morning. So it's my pleasure now to introduce Betsy Christian, uh, Congressman Pitt's legislative assistant, who will hopefully be interrupted by Congressman Pitts as she gives welcome this morning. Uh, she's worked essentially from a three-year perspective and uh, is extremely familiar with a place called Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is my wife's hometown. So would you please join us, Betsy? Mr. Ambassador, Dr. Campy, thank you all for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, I love this room. It's so full of rich history and majesty, and we're delighted that we can be in it today. 
First and foremost, Congressman Pitts uh, wants me to express his deepest regrets that he could not be here this morning. I still have hope that he'll pop in. Um, at the last minute, a bicameral Republican conference was called regarding health care. As many of you know, this is uh, probably the most uh, impactful week that we've had on the Hill regarding health care, and he, he needed to attend that meeting today, but he did want me to express his deepest regrets. Um, he was very much looking forward to hearing your presentation. Congressman Pitts deeply cares about Mongolia. He loves the country's long and storied history. Once ruled by the great Genghis Khan, I know I just butchered that, uh, in the 13th century, Mongolia has emerged from the clutches of communism to become a flourishing republic. Since coming to Congress in 1997, Congressman Pitts has had the pleasure of meeting many ambassadors and foreign leaders, but he's particularly enjoyed building his relationship with the Mongolian embassy. He's also had the opportunity to travel to Mongolia in 1998. It's a beautiful country with a rich cultural history. He had a wonderful experience and he hopes to return in the future. Dr. Campy, thank you for sharing your expertise and your research with us. It's truly without a doubt that your book will contribute to the American and Northeast Asian diplomatic history. Once again, Congressman Pitts wishes he could be here and thanks you all for coming. And thank you for letting me speak on his behalf. It's now my distinguished pleasure and honor to introduce His Excellency the Ambassador, Bekat. I was visiting a few moments ago with the Ambassador and learned that he'd actually been at his post here following two other distinguished posts around the world, both in Paris as well as in Geneva. So, sir, we're honored that you joined us this morning. Would you care to make a few opening remarks? Thank you. Mr. Peter Yan, Chief of the Library of Congress Asian Division, Dr. Alicia Campi, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. I am personally extremely pleased to attend today's book presentation event in this impressive and beautiful room of the Library of the Congress. This is the latest publication on Mongolia entitled uh, The Impact of China and Russia on the United States-Mongolian Political Relations in the 20th Century by our great friend, Alicia Campi. As you know, Alicia is one of the leading American scholars of Mongolian studies and a great friend of my country. She authored this book, uh, with uh, Mrs. Basson, one of the distinguished members of the Mongolian Foreign Service. Today, Mongolia and the U.S. enjoy most friendly relations and a strong partnership. It seems to many of us uh, quite natural, but uh, not everybody knows uh, how tortuous was the road leading to January 27, 1987, this historic day when the U.S. became the hundredth country to definitely recognize contemporary independent Mongolia by establishing diplomatic relations. With this great 600 pages book, Alicia is offering us a fascinating journey into the history of our bilateral relations, which date back to the dawn of the last 20th century. This is a superb job, not only uncovering every corner of the history of early contacts between our two countries. It relates also how and why the U.S. became Mongolia's best friend to accompany its democratic transition. 
The foundation for this book uh, was laid down by Alicia's scholarly interest in, Mongo in the Mongolia-U.S. political relationship in the first half of the 20th century, which resulted in her doctoral dissertation in mid-1980s, if I am right. Hundreds of hours uh, spent later in the archives, uh, both in the U.S. and the Mongolia, in search of new documents, new evidences, not exposed to the general public, enriched tremendously this fascinating book. You can discover many, many great names of US diplomats of US politicians and statesmen in, in this book, whose names will be remembered forever by the history of our bilateral relation. For example, you will discover or you will know more about Rock Hill, Duke, uh, Mongolian Duke, Larson, uh, eminent uh, diplomat Sakobin, greatest among American scholars on Mongolia, on Latimer, and so on, so on. And of course, the book illuminates uh, the role of uh, such a great U.S. statesmen as uh, Herbert Hoover and uh, Vice President Wallace. There are other great personalities uh, who participated in a way and other in forging and promoting U.S.-Mongolia bilateral relationship. It's great. Alicia played an instrumental role in the Mongolia-U.S. diplomatic talks during mid-1980s, serving as a consular officer at the American Embassy in Tokyo. Alicia was responsible for the channel of dialogue with the Mongols. This very dialogue revealed finally extremely productive. You know, uh, we can watch on big screens everywhere in the United States and abroad, precious. This movie uh, is uh, truly one of those uh, deserving Oscars. Obviously, there are many, many infinite precious in the life. The life is worth, uh, because of that, uh, the life is worth to live. So I will say that uh, this book is a precious one. Not only illuminating the history of our bilateral relationship, but uh, as an indication, as a clear indication of the need there is to preserve, to promote, to nurture and develop our bilateral ties, the friendship between Mongolia and the US. And thank you very much, Dr. Alicia, for your precious book. And we will uh, keep the book as that for long. Thank you very much for your attention. That was wonderful. Your allusion to the movie was just perfect. Uh, 
it's now my pleasure to introduce, I hope, uh, Dr. Or, excuse me, Mr. Byron Zhao from the Mong Mongolian desk officer from something called the U.S. Department of State. Ambassador Beckbot, Ms. Christian, Mr. Young, and distinguished guests, uh, I would just like to thank you all for the kind invitation to this event, and I would also like to express the personal regrets of Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State, Joseph Donovan. He's uh, the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian Pacific Affairs. He had wanted to be here today, but he was also unavoidably engaged in another series of meetings, uh, but we just um, wanted to express his uh, strong, earnest desire to be here today. It is my distinct pleasure, however, as the State Department Mongolia Desk Officer, to be here today as we honor the extraordinary scholarly achievements of Dr. Alicia Campi and celebrate the publication of her truly groundbreaking book, on U.S.-Mongolia diplomatic relations, an issue which, as you can imagine, is of primary importance to me. As many of you know, Dr. Campy was not only witness to the birth of this bilateral relationship, she played a key role in the negotiations which laid the foundation for over 20 years of partnership between the U.S. and Mongolia. Just three months ago, Mongolia celebrated the 20th anniversary of its democratic opening. This coming July will mark the 20th anniversary of the first open parliamentary elections in Mongolia's history. This is important because the enduring friendship between our two countries has grown from a deep-seated belief in the value of democratic government and a shared belief that all people have the inalienable right to elect their political leaders. Today, through our friendship, we not only share a vision of peace and stability in the world, but we are actively working together to achieve that vision. And I wanted to acknowledge again Dr. Campy's role in bringing this about. It is also as friends of the people of Mongolia that the State Department and the American people will be closely watching the development of the current winter crisis in Mongolia. As the winter progresses through spring, through to spring, we will remain in close communication with the government of Mongolia, and our thoughts will be with all of those who are suffering through the Zud crisis. It has been a long road from those first peaceful protests for democracy in Mongolia on December 10, 1989, to today as has been so richly portrayed in Dr. Campy's book. Mongolia has faced challenges, undergone periods of evolution and reinvention, and emerged strong and vibrant. And so as we begin the 23rd year of diplomatic relations between the United States and Mongolia, I want to congratulate Mongolia and Ambassador Bekba on your accomplishments over the last 20 years. And I want to congratulate again Dr. Campy on this auspicious occasion, and just say that we all look forward to your next work with bated breath. Thank you very much. Now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce a person who I think needs no introduction, given this morning's talks. But Alicia Campy uh, has not only created a work here, of significant uh, scholarship and understanding, but I think she's also fulfilled a lifetime dream, something that uh, she mentioned to me earlier this morning that started, I believe, in the fifth grade, to find a person who has actually caught on to their life's work at that young age and pursued it with a dream is truly precious, Dr. Campy. Before I start, I'd like to ask um, Byron Sal to come up to receive this book, a copy of this book, which I am presenting um, to him to pass to Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, who is mentioned in the book and her trip to Mongolia, which took place in the 1990s. Um, the inscription 
that I have written for her is, to Secretary of State Clinton, with compliments of the authors, the um, other author of this book, Mrs. Bassan, was Mrs. Clinton's interpreter during her trip to Mongolia. May your efforts to advance U.S.-Mongolian relations be successful. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to sincerely thank Congressman Pitts and Betsy Christian, the Mongolian Embassy and Ambassador Bekbat, uh, the Library of Congress's Congressional Relations Office and the Asian Division for giving me the opportunity to speak to you all today on the topic of U.S.-Mongolian relations over the past century. Special thanks to my co-author, Mrs. Basson in Ulaanbaatar, Byron Sow at the Department of State, Dr. Peter Young, Susan Meinheit, and Reme Grafalda at the Library of Congress, Mrs. Carol Arnold here, who represents my family today, the co-editors of this long book who are in the audience, um, Dr. David Cohen and Ruth Kurtzbauer, stand up. They d really deserve applause for pouring through all those footnotes. <laughs> um, Mr. Bilik Batsorek for his assistance with the appendices and photographs, and a former Mongolian ambassador to the United States, Rav Dunbold, who was my counterpart in Tokyo in the mid-1980s when we did the preliminary negotiations to establish bilateral relations. Beyond mere recognition of American contacts with Mongolia during the Siberian intervention in World War I and with Inner Mongolia during World War II, historians and political scientists have not investigated what role the United States played in Mongolia's independence struggle. It is no wonder that East Asian historians assumed there were no substantive exchanges between the two nations. However, in 1986, I completed a PhD dissertation at Indiana University under the direction of the famous Mongolian um, and then transplanted to the United States Mongolist, Dr. John Gombojab Hangen, on the political relationship between the United States and Outer Mongolia, 1915 to 1927, the Kalgan Consular Records, and proved such assumptions very wrong. The dissertation presented new primary evidence about the relatively broad-based nature of political and commercial relations between the United States and Mongolia after World War I. The main sources for the dissertation's research were the records of the U.S. consulate in Kalgan, today Zhangjiakou, in North China, in the National Archives in Washington, D.C. These archival records of 50 bound volumes were a treasure trove of new information, including priceless and until then unknown diplomatic documents. My dissertation research was the genesis for this book's long overdue historical analysis because it substantiated the existence of a bilateral relationship of much broader depth and scope than previously realized. In the midst of my dissertation research, I entered diplomatic service in 1978. I was able to meet many young Mongols posted to New York City as officials and later in Japan, who were to become important national leaders and lifelong friends. Furthermore, in the 1980s, as a diplomat stationed at the U.S. Embassy in Tokyo, Japan, under Ambassador Mike Mansfield, I was able with my Mongolian counterpart, Mr. Bold, to participate in negotiations which led to the formal uh, bilateral diplomatic relations we enjoy today. In 1990, I was posted to the U.S. Embassy in Ulaanbaatar, attending Mongolian language classes as the first American student at the Mongolian National University, 
and facilitating negotiations as cultural affairs officer to establish the Peace Corps program in Mongolia. During this exciting period, I was an eyewitness to the fall of the Mongolian communist government by peaceful democratic street demonstrations. It was in Ulaanbaatar in 1990 that I first met the co-author of this book, Mrs. Raksha Basan, a distinguished member of Mongolia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs for over 30 years. When Mrs. Bassan was posted to the Mongolian Embassy in Washington, D.C. in the late 1990s, we conceived of the idea to write a book together on our nation's long quest for official political relations. Our book is the first analysis in the field of diplomatic history by two female diplomats who were active in forging policy from the two concerned countries. Mrs. Bassan retired from her ministry in August 2001 to do book research at Indiana University and most importantly in the government of Mongolia's national archives and in the archival collections in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense. In the meantime, I spent many months doing new research in the collections of the Library of Congress's especially Asia division and found heretofore undiscovered documents from military intelligence and declassified sources that filled in key gaps on the American side. The story of US and Mongolian relations and how these were influenced and even thwarted for many decades by the Chinese and Russians is full of many interesting anecdotes and individuals. The first American diplomat to meet Mongols and go to today's Ulaanbaatar was William Rockhill, whose entire personal 6,000 volume collection of Chinese, Tibetan, and Mongolian books was donated to the Library of Congress. While a young diplomat in China, he tried to go through North Chinese territories populated by Mongol tribes, disguising his six foot plus frame in a Mongol gown and fur cap to cover his clean shaven head and face in the winter of 1888 and 1889. Years later, after becoming ambassador to both China and to Russia, he spent a very cold January 1913 in Mongolia's capital on his way by railroad from Turkey to Beijing. Did you know that a young Herbert Hoover, while an engineer in North China in 1899, rode up to Mongolia's capital on horseback and met the Mongolian Buddhist leader, Bog Khan, the equivalent to the Dalai Lama, riding a bicycle madly around an inner court in the capital's biggest monastery, Gandan. This same Bog Khan wrote a secret letter to US authorities in Beijing in 1918, saying, I, Bogda Tsitsandamba, living Buddha and emperor of the autonomous outer Mongolia to the honorable minister representing the great American people in China, send joyful greetings. We, outer Mongolians, since we became autonomous from the Chinese and since our government came into power, have always wished to have friendly intercourse and business relations with outside great powers but because of the long distances and because of the Hyak Convention, this wish of the Mongolian people has been denied. In the meantime, some of your people have come to our city of Orga, that's Ulaanbaatar, to live and do business. Now our government has sent to China the small living Buddha with the pretense of buying useful things as a messenger with a letter to your excellency. We hope that this letter will be favorably considered 
and that the great American government will be able to send a consul and to open a consular office at Orga. We Mongols have sent this letter quite privately to you without notification to the Russian or the Chinese government. But we hope that you will give us before long a favorable reply, either by wire or by letter. As a result of this request, U.S. Consul General Charles Eberhardt was sent to the Mongolian capital in the spring of 1920, when it was under Chinese occupation and met with many Mongolian leaders. He was given three documents to send to Washington, including one which pleaded for American military aid to resist the Chinese occupiers. Eventually, Samuel Sokobin of Newark, New Jersey, a Chinese language specialist, was appointed as consul to Mongolian territories and opened the U.S. consulate in Kaogan on April 1, 1921. Sokobin made four trips to Ulaanbaatar in 1921 and 1922 and so was an eyewitness to the early years of Mongolia's communist era. The Mongolian Prime Minister Bodo gave him a written request for recognition, which actually was never officially answered by the Department of State. We express our good wishes to the esteemed excellency of the Foreign Ministry of the United States. We hope your esteemed excellency, the government of your esteemed country, and your people will take note of this. However, now we specially proclaim that it is the hope of the Holy Emperor, the government, and the people to establish as soon as possible a treaty between the government of your esteemed country and our Mongolian people's government to have a resident ambassador to further develop commercial relations and to increase benefits to both countries. Therefore, we beg your esteemed excellencies immediate consideration of our request and hope for a favorable reply. Sokobin was also unfortunately responsible for the break in direct US contact with Mongolia when in a car chase across the Gobi Desert, straight out of an Indiana Jones story, the consul became involved in shielding a young US citizen murderer, which angered the reactionary um, uh, Bolshevik advisors of the Mongols and the new Mongolian revolutionary government leaders. With Sokobin declared persona non grata, he and subsequent US officials in the 1920s relied on an informant network of businessmen and scientists, including the dinosaur man, Roy Chapman Andrews, to tell them about events in increasingly isolated communist Mongolia. It would be two decades later in June 1944 that US direct contact with Mongolia resumed. This was during a short two-day Ulaanbaatar visit, which is depicted here on the cover of the book, with Marshal Choi Balsan, often called Mongolia's Stalin, by Roosevelt's Vice President Henry Wallace, accompanied by the great American, Chinese, and Mongolian expert Owen Lattimore. Wallace later reported to President Truman that I said with regard to Mongolia that the Mongolians were livestock people and that they had, there had always been misunderstanding between Mongols and China because the Chinese were a sedentary agricultural people. I said it was perfectly natural under the circumstances that the Mongolians would look towards Russia as a source of progress rather than towards China. My research also discovered the reasons behind the several failed attempts after World War II to establish U.S.-Mongolian diplomatic relations. A great chance was missed in early 1946 after 
the general Chiang Kai-shek, had agreed in principle to recognize the independence of Mongolia. A mid-ranking official in the Department of State, John Carter Vincent, as director of the Office of Far Eastern Affairs, disagreed with the favorable opinions of the department's lawyer and other officials, and so recommended a policy of wait and non-action. Another chance was lost in the early 1960s when the Kennedy administration, supported by then Democratic majority leader Mike Mansfield, sought to recognize Mongolia as well as agree to its accession to the United Nations. Chiang Kai-shek at that time was very much against such recognition and cleverly tied his position to maintaining the ROC seat in the UN Security Council. A Mongolian initiative to open talks which came from its embassy in New Delhi during the Nixon administration, during the Johnson administration, also was blocked by the Chinese. And then Henry Kissinger and President Nixon both supported establishing relations and talked in fact to Mao in Beijing on their visit in the early 70s. But the Soviets, particularly Andrei Gromyko, pressured the Mongols to reject the US overture and General Zhang also played on his long-standing friendship with Nixon to scuttle the idea. Soviet Premier Brezhnev was similarly negative towards the Carter administration's approach to bilateral recognition talks and even the ultimately successful negotiations to open bilateral um, talks in the mid-1980s lurched forward in fits and starts because of US government distrust of the Mongols and Soviet behind the scenes maneuvering. Only the encouragement of Soviet Foreign Minister Shevardnadze and President Gorbachev overcame the Mongolian Politburo's reluctance to agree to normal diplomatic relations. The US-Mongolia story cannot be divorced from the modern history of Asia. The basic problem for the United States at the beginning of the 20th century was that it did not understand the legal status of Mongolia. It was most reluctant to implement a definitive foreign policy towards Mongolia, and because little information flowed into the Department of State about Mongolian events, the result was a policy of inaction that persisted for decades. As for the Mongols, their limited knowledge of the United States and the, their unrealistic view of its potential to assist them in asserting their national sovereignty were evident from the very beginning of the relationship. The Mongols did not recognize that American foreign policy immaturity regarding Asia would be so influenced by a much more experienced China and Russia, as those two countries vied for dominance over the Mongolian plateau. There was a window of opportunity for the two nations to develop substantive and formal relations in the early 1920s. This opportunity grew out of the opening of an American consulate in Kalgan to monitor the rapidly changing political and commercial events in inner and outer Mongolia. Although this office existed only for seven years, from 1921 to 1927, its lifespan covered a very hectic and complicated period in Asian history. The Bolsheviks in Russia expanded and, co and consolidated their power in Siberia. China experienced the rise of warlordism and civil strife. And Japan intensified its political and military machinations in North China and Manchuria. For Mongolia, these years were extremely significant as the land of nomads moved from a feudalistic, theocratic, hierarchical state to the beginnings of a modern, revolutionary communist nation. Mongolia, which initially had reached out to the United States for assistance in solidifying and legitimating its independence from China, came under the yoke of Bolshevik anti-American propaganda. 
that eventually froze political contact and overt interest in pursuing diplomatic relations. The peculiar convoluted story of direct contacts between US and Mongol officials during this period reveals how miscalculations and misinterpretations on both sides, uh, fed by Chinese and Russian interference, overwhelmed initial curiosity and goodwill to freeze substantive political and trade relations for 60 years. The United States during the Cold War could not overcome its anti-communist hostility toward the Soviet Union and the PRC, nor resist ROC, Republic of China, pressure against recognition of Mongolian independence. Many opportunities for diplomatic relations were missed in the early 1960s and 1970s, again due to manipulation by the nation nationalist Chinese and Soviet governments. When Washington was ready to seriously discuss establishing relations, Mongolia was pressured by the Soviets into silent non-responsiveness, which frustrated several administrations of American policymakers. The years after the establishment of diplomatic ties in many ways have been even more remarkable. With so much of their economic and political world in collapse, Mongolian policymakers outline a strategy of looking for a third neighbor to counterbalance their two physical neighbors. In the 1990s, such a role for the US initially was considered by political pundits on both sides to be a pipe dream. Yet step by step, the dream became reality for both Mongolia and the United States in the aftermath of September 11, 2001 and the rise of international terrorism. The political relationship between the United States and Mongolia during the 20th century is a complicated, intricate story with many strands and numerous false starts. The cast of characters is varied including missionaries, diplomats, scientists, adventurers, businessmen, presidents, and a living Buddha. In addition, it is an interesting case study of just how difficult it can be to establish diplomatic relations between two very diverse peoples, and of how other nations, for their own purposes, can manipulate events to prevent mutual understanding. Yet it is apparent that it is not fair to blame China and Russia for the failure of the US and Mongolia to develop bilateral relations in a timely manner. The many failures and ultimate success in establishing diplomatic relations must rest on American and Mongolian shoulders. I believe that my book research reveals a few crucial points, both about diplomatic history and doing research. One, in diplomacy and research, never assume you know everything there is or that there is nothing to know. We have wonderful libraries full of treasures. Explore them and you will find many historical and practical surprises that will lead you to success and greater understanding. For example, no one knew, they weren't cataloged for example, that there were Mongolian language original scroll documents from 1918 to 1921 from the Mongolian government to the Secretary of State sitting unopened and unread in the National Archives until I found them in the library stacks. When looking at a microfiche version of Vice President Henry Wallace's diary out in Iowa, I found stuck into the diary and just filmed a confidential never seen report from the journalist Edgar Snow to the US Department of War, now the Defense Department, about interviewing a Mongolian delegation in Moscow in 1943. Because the US government's archival records 
were so abundant, I had to limit the scope of analysis to the political relationship between the United States and Mongolia during the 20th century. There remains additional material in the Kalgan consulate files at the National Archives on U.S.-Mongolian early commercial relations. It is likely that even more information about the scope and nature of bilateral diplomatic contacts can be uncovered in diplomatic correspondence from the American legation and embassy documents from Beijing, Nanjing, Taipei, Eastern European capitals, Japan, and Moscow, as well as consulates in Mukden, now Shenyang, and Harbin. Of course, the records of the U.S. Embassy in Ulaanbaatar and the Mongolian Embassy in Washington, D.C., both which opened in 1987, are still classified, but eventually will be available to diplomatic historians. Point two. Young diplomats, like Mr. Tsao, and our friends from the Mongolian embassy here, young diplomats in today's world can influence political and economic events in a positive way if they work with their hearts as well as their heads when given the opportunity or to make their own opportunities. The young U.S. consul in Kalgan, Samuel Sokobin, who I met as an old man at 83 years of age, he was that old, not me, he visited Ulaanbaatar six weeks after the Communist Revolution of 1921. He was a last-minute replacement for that post because of a, another sick officer. My chance in Tokyo came after a higher-ranking American official in the embassy's political section had a failed dinner meeting with the Mongols, but Ambassador Mansfield decided to try to reach out one more time to the Mongols, and so sent me. And my third point, chance. An individual, even quirky personalities, are major contributors to history including diplomatic relations, more than most analysts know and want to give credit for. We have the example of missionary, businessman, interpreter, and spy for several governments, Franz August Larson, known as Duke of Mongolia. American Consul Samuel Sokobin, American businessman Robert Williams, that was the murderer. Ambassador Mike Mansfield, and Mongolian UN Ambassador Nyamdo are other examples of where personalities greatly impact on history. So in conclusion, the US and Mongolia today need to expand and diversify their friendly ties in a challenging international climate based on mutual respect and the promotion of democratic, equitable, and transparent free enterprise institutions. Both nations must be good neighbors. The great and powerful nations of China and Russia always will have a deep interest in Mongolia and how it develops its relationship with the United States. This fact will not change. Recognizing this reality, as well as having an informed appreciation of the torturous path they took toward the establishment of normal diplomatic relations, the United States and Mongolia will then increase their chances of forging a strong and binding relationship for the future. Thank you very much. Questions? Um, are there any questions that I can answer? Yes, Ruth? Well, of course, Japan is, is very active in Inner Mongolia. And because um, 
in the 30s and then in the 40s. And because of Japanese involvement in Inner Mongolia, the United States um, reaches out to Inner Mongolian tribes um, during the Chinese Civil War and World War II. And because the United States is reaching out to Inner Mongolians, then this attracts the attention of the Outer Mongolian governments and the Soviet governments. At the same time, um, in many cases, when the United States and Mongolia failed to establish diplomatic relations in the 60s and the 70s, other countries benefit. When we agree to the accession of Mongolia to the United Nations, but fail in the Kennedy administration to, to recognize Mongolia as an independent country, the beneficiary was England because the talks were going on and the results told to the English and the English who didn't have the political situation benefited from that. In the 70s, the failure in the, um, the Nixon administration talks, the beneficiary were the Japanese who had been informed all along of how our negotiations were going and then when the ball was dropped by the US, the Japanese took advantage of this. So um, there's also a famous battle of Hulk and Goal, which took place in 1939 when the Japanese attempted to um, uh, enter and occupy Eastern Mongolia, and they were repulsed by a joint Mongol-Soviet army. Um, battlefield reports I discovered, which were, are declassified, um, of the Japanese uh, several month long campaign um, were, are held by military and other reporting serv uh, sources in U.S. embassies uh, like in Eastern Europe, which you, I found them being reported out of Warsaw, where Americans are talking to the Russians about the Japanese, and, and I discovered and published in the book for people interested in that battle, new statistics on airplanes and casualties in a daily way because newspaper men sent out of Beijing would go to the battlefield area and were reporting back to the uh, Beijing military attache office. And these, these statistics, I checked with um, some people here, including Dr. Dennis Voden, who's in the United States, is rather well known for his studies of this, and found out that, that um, the, the books on that battle did not include those statistics from other sources. So it, it's a very interesting situation how you can see um, the story of Asia and other Western governments and other Asian governments um, reflected and beneficiaries of the relationship between the U.S. and Mongolia. Yes? Well, yes, it's a complicated story, but bottom line is there were treaties actually established during the, the dynastic period in China in the Manchu, of the Manchu dynasty um, regarding um, the borders of Mongolian territory, what they called Outer Mongolia. And these were um, uh, solidified and ratified in a treaty which was mentioned briefly in one of the readings, the Khyak Treaty, which was between the Tsarist Russian state, um, the Manchu state, and uh, Mongolian authorities, which establishes the northern border and the general definition of outer Mongolia. Um, then we also have um, negotiations that took place uh, throughout the 20th century, and so that actually there are no outstanding border uh, disputes at all between PRC China and Mongolia. Um, part of uh, the history of this is connected with the relationship between the Mongols 
in independent Mongolia and the people of Inner Mongolia, the different tribes of Inner Mongolia who live um, on the other side of the Gobi Desert and um, the policy of the Manchu Qing Dynasty for 300 years in treating the tribes of Inner Mongolia differently and administering them differently than the ones in Halka Outer Mongolia. And so the borders that were created actually is a system that it doesn't uh, exist from communist times. It has antecedents in the fact that uh, the Manchus who were from Manchuria were, are ethnically cousins to the Mongols. They are not uh, Chinese Sinetic people at all. And so they had, particularly in the early part of the dynasty, special relationship and, and gave the Mongolians in what is now independent Mongolia special considerations. And eventually this moves into law. Right. You have treaties on boundaries um, written in Latin, used the, um, written in Latin by um, Catholic priests for the parties involved in the 1600s. Yes? You mean in 1990 when I went there? When I was in, lived in Ulaanbaatar in 1990, and the, the conditions were very difficult for the Americans. Um, I see the embassy today, and to me, it's like heaven. Um, we were, um, at that time, Mongolia had um, only uh, 20 um, representative countries, including from the Soviet bloc, who had ambassadors living in um, Ulaanbaatar. Even our ambassador was non-resident. I was, in fact, allowed to stay in his apartment, in his bed. Not with him, though, please, let's make that clear. Um, that was Ambassador Richard Williams, the first one. So at that time, we were physically placed into a compound, which had a gate and a guard, with other um, countries that um, had very small presence. So we were with the Palestinians. They were, in Mongolia, people live in p apartment blocks with um, entrances. And in these entrances, one entrance was the Americans, where they lived and had their embassy. Another was um, the Japanese, before the Japanese embassy opened, I um, was good friends with the Japanese doctor. Then there's the Palestinians, the Afghans, because we didn't have large enough establishments. Now, because I already spoke, spoke Chinese, I um, tr tried to make the acquaintance of Chinese diplomats. They were... Um, not very social at that point, and relations were very poor because um, I think one of the ways to understand American policy towards China in the 19, I mean towards Mongolia in the 1990s, is to not look at it from the context of where we are today, where China is today. Our policies towards Mongolia and Mongolia's interest in quickly establishing a relationship um, at the end of the uh, communist era in 1990 and 91 with the United States are all influenced by what had happened in Tiananmen. And you have to remember, after Tiananmen for one year, the United States completely fle freezes its relations, its educational exchanges with China. And because of this, the Chinese embassy at that point was very isolated and under siege, but the Chinese always, in their diplomatic presence, put great um, st uh, importance on, a st on having people go to Mongolia who are specialists in Mongolian history and language. And most of those diplomats had been sent out to inner Mongolian universities, had mo uh, inner Mongolian women as their spouses, and they spoke fluently. But in, the in 1990, when I was there, because they were under siege because of the situation with Tiananmen, 
They were not particularly friendly with socialist bloc countries, and they also did not feel very comfortable with American and the Western nations of Japan and England that had embassies there. Thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, our Honorable Ambassador Bigfoot, Mr. Byron Tsai, and our other friends, dear friend Susan, it's very nice to see you today. And I'm here on, on behalf of uh, Mongolian Community Association, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Dr. Alicia Campy. Uh, our community is, uh, comparing to other communities, it's young, I would say even infant, because we started coming to this country a little over 10 years ago, in big numbers. I got to this country like 11 years ago, and I remember there were like many, maybe 40 or 50 people in this area, that's it. So uh, since then, uh, the Mongolians, they start coming more and more, and uh, our community association was established like eight years ago, and since then, we have known Ali uh, Dr. Alicia Campi very well, and we close to, uh, we, we have worked with her very closely all these years, uh, and we were lucky to have somebody who knows uh, M Mongols, Mongolian culture, and all this stuff. It was really helpful for us uh, in our process of adapting to new home, new country, and uh, stuff like that. And here is, I got the uh, award for Dr. Alicia Kempi. Uh, we we were going to uh, the, get this award to the Dr. Alicia Kempi on our New Year's Eve banquet of community, but she was busy at the time. I would, I, I, I would assume that she was working at home hard, like studying Mongolian-American relationships, <laughs> so she couldn't get, she couldn't get off, her, off her table, so <laughs> desk. So I'm here now, uh, and I think things, uh, things happen for a reason. So I think it's meant to be, you know, handed to you in the Congress of, of Library. Uh, there are like uh, six billion people in a, around the world. How many people get their book presentation and award in the Congress of Library? Not too many, I guess. <laughs> so, so this is uh, on a uh, award uh, on behalf of Mongolian Community Association in Washington D.C. But I think it's probably on behalf of all Mongols, because I don't think your all excellent work uh, advancing studying Mongolian American relationship, your enormous work, I don't think it benefits all, only Mongols living in DC. It benefits all Mongols. So we appreciate very, very much your hard work. And it's my, I, I really would have trouble finding many people who's in expertise, excellent expertise and expert in Mongolian American relationship. So you are the, one of the best. So thank you, thank you very much for, for your hard work. I want to I want to just briefly thank the members of the Mongolian Community Association of the Greater Washington DC area. They have a Mongolian school here which um, promotes Mongolian language and culture and um, has always been very welcoming and needs the support of the uh, Americans in our community. And the community is doing great things to make sure that our, our Mongolians, who uh, some of whom uh, become permanent residents or American citizens, um, know about American laws and taxes, unfortunately. They do all kinds of things to inform people, and it's really a wonderful and growing association, and I'm proud of um, being associated with them, and I thank them so much for this award. It's very meaningful to me. And now I think we would like to um, uh, invite Ambassador Beckbot to offer concluding remarks, please. <laughs> uh, dear friends, uh, I think this is in uh,
a, a very exciting and enriching event. The uh, book itself is uh, very impressive indeed. And uh, it allows uh, to take and to be aware of real importance of our endeavors in order to make our bilateral Mongolia-US relationship stronger and stronger. I would like to express uh, our thanks to the Library of the Congress, to Asian Division of the Library, uh, for offering us this wonderful location, this uh, magnificent room. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, express uh, my sincere thanks uh, to all of you uh, sharing this, uh, uh, this event. And we will remember this event uh, forever because uh, if you see uh, different aspects of this very event. Uh, if you read every page of the precious uh, uh, Alicia's uh, book, uh, you will really understand uh, what it is about. For us, it's so important and so precious. So thank you again to all of you for sharing this event. And I wish you on behalf of the embassy, on behalf of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Mongolia, of all uh, your Mongolian friends, uh, every success, good health, prosperity, this uh, important year for our bilateral relations. Uh, 2010 is uh, important because we are celebrating throughout this year 20th anniversary of Mongolian democracy building. Uh, it's uh, roughly the, the story itself uh, of our bilateral friendship and the, our bilateral partnership. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.